Uh, hi, I'm Ed. And um, as uh, Tom said, I, I, my, I run a startup that has an app, a mo mobile app and desktop app, all, bit, all built on Ember, um, being used in a small number of, but growing number of nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And um, it's probably one of the oldest Ember apps still in continuous evolutionary use because I started it uh, on Sprout Core 1.6 RC2. Uh, yeah, that's right. And it has evolved along with Ember all the way, and it's running Canary right now. So that has not been easy. Um, you might question my sanity if, because I wrote a kind of highly critical application on pretty immature technology, but I do think it has paid off, and it's certainly paid off in spades now to see how awesome the community is now. Um, you know, we, um, I, I started using it even in its premature state because I knew I was going to write something very like it but much crappier by myself. And I think a lot of other people felt the same way and realized that together we could make something a whole hell of a lot better. So um, really gratifying stuff. So I'm going to talk today about animation and, and transitions and uh, how those fit in with an Ember application because it's not obvious. If you've just come out of you know, an introduction to Ember kind of tutorial, it hasn't really covered the little nooks and crannies of Ember that you're going to have to interact with if you want to have these kind of more dynamic behaviors. Um, so you know, first, uh, at a meta level, my, my talk here, my slides are an Ember app. You could follow along, you could dissect them, and actually you really should. Like checking out the source to the things I'm going to show is actually, you know, on your own time when you could do it in detail is actually a really good way to see what I've been doing and give me, you know, generate feedback for me and for everybody to so other ways that maybe you're solving these problems in your applications. Um, and as I said, my app has evolved over a long period of time already, well, long for Ember, right? It's, Three years is, an, is ancient history. Um, so it's been a long time since I've actually just started a fresh Ember app from scratch. So on Sunday night, when I realized I should really start putting a talk together, I said, well, I'm just going to write a new Ember app that would be my talk. And I have to say, I was so impressed at how easy it has become. And this is a shout out to Joe, uh, who just talked, and to Stefan. You know, this is built on Ember CLI, and it's built with broccoli. And we got the ES6 transpiler. And I had never touched any of that stuff before Sunday night, but I built this whole app from then to now. And it went pretty good. So I was, you know, the promise is real. Um, so um, when we talk about putting animation into an application, I'm actually not talking about this, right? I mean, <laughs> this is cool. It's a great introductory slide, right? But it doesn't offer really much in the way of value. Uh, it's eye candy. And, there's nothing wrong with it, but if you were just had to sit and stare at this every day while your app took 60 seconds to load, you wouldn't, you'd really come to hate the Tomster. Um, you know, so, and we've had animations like this on the web for a long, long time. right? Uh, there's nothing new about putting animation on the web if you're talking about that. That's, that's circa 1993 web animation, right? Um, so what I'm really talking about are, are a new way, another way to put physical metaphors into computing. Right. We can't even talk about user interface design without using physical metaphors. We talk about windows, we talk about folders. None of these things are real, right? They're all just metaphorical. And that's the only way we, can, we as human beings can relate to something as weird and abstract as computing. Um, now, what was, what was new in iOS 7? What was the big design trend? Flat, exactly. And so flat is this repudiation of being skeuomorphic, right? Skeuomorphic is when you're taking in incidental things about an older medium and copying them into a new medium where they're not necessary, but they just feel comfortable, right? So when, you know, clearly the earlier versions of iOS were very, very skeuomorphic, very textured, you know, leather looked like leather, things moved like they were physical. Um, and then the iOS 7 comes along and it's this big repudi repudiation of being skeuomorphic, right? And it's not just Apple, it's a design trend, right? Android, you could have argued, was, it was ahead on being flat. Um, I'm going to argue, though, that we're not actually repudiating being skeuomorphic, being physical. Um, we're, we're dropping some of the more gratuitous aspects of that, which is things like the rich textures and some of the shadows and things. Um, but we're actually keeping something that's really critical about being skeuomorphic, and that's not skeuomorphic appearance, but skeuomorphic behavior. 
right? So if you think about browsing the Ember app here on your mobile device, right? Why does it have momentum, right? Momentum's a physical thing. It's not something that is fundamental to com computing, right? We put it in because it, it tweaks that little primitive piece of our monkey brain that understands how the world's supposed to behave, and it makes it just feel very natural, and it's a huge win for usability, right? I'm going to argue that's just as skeuomorphic as having a fake leather texture, and arguably more usefully so. And so these are the kind of behaviors, once you have animations and transitions in your application, that have a real payoff for users. Um, I'm going to jump, actually, to another example of that. Um, you know, uh, another kind of behavior that we see a lot on a mobile device is uh, navigating to a detail like this where we move and we slide, right? And this is so simple, but it's a very powerful metaphor that helps users not get lost, right? Our, again, our primitive primate minds are not built around, they're not evolved to, to perceive things just instantly appearing and instantly disappearing. Where do they go? Where do they come from? Well, they don't go or come from anywhere, right? That's still a metaphor. We're still talking in metaphors. But we need those metaphors to relate, right? And maybe, maybe not necessarily we in this room, because we have an unusual amount of practice and years of training to think about abstractions and to think abstractly. And um, we're kind of freakish like that. Most people don't encounter that in their daily lives. They don't ever have to spend as much time pushing around imaginary objects as we do. Um, and so the more you can relate to the, to the way they are, their mind already relates to physical things, the better. And so something as simple as this pattern that we've see, we see again and again in you know, your basic iOS app, it's powerful because there's a physical place, right? I know I want to go back to the left. And so that, that piece of my mind that's super optimized for keeping track of where things are in space is helping me keep track of where I am in the application. If, this, if that animation was gone, all the functionality could be there. I would just instantly go from screen to screen. But people would get lost much more easily. And that's, so that's the kind of compelling reason why we put animations and transitions into an application. Um, so let's talk about how we actually do this in, in the Ember case specifically. Um, in Ember, uh, there's a couple classes of challenges into getting your animations in. Uh, we can kind of split animations into two broad categories in an Ember app. And like much of Ember, it all comes down to the, the centrality of routing. So if you're talking about animating something that's within a single route, that's what I'd call the simple case. And as the, the kind of Ember component, component capabilities have evolved, they've gotten quite powerful enough to do really nice things uh, within, within a given route and animate it. So in this particular case, uh, you know, here is, here's the template for what I was just showing you. Right? I made a little component called animate changes. So you could say animate changes of hours, animate changes of minutes. And so I can write my template in this way that is very straightforward and clear. It's not cluttered with a lot of extra markup. It's not cluttered with uh, CSS-isms other than a couple of classes so I can see, tell which things are times and which are moods because I'm styling them differently. And so you see I've actually achieved the thing that CSS claims you can achieve that is the aspirational ideal, right, which is separating your content from your presentation. Um, there's nothing in here about how I'm animating it, right? The fact that I'm, the fact that the hours and minutes drop whereas the moods fade, right, um, that's on my CSS file, and I'm not even going to go into the CSS file because that's standard stuff. That's not Ember specific. That's just putting your time and beat your head against the browser to make it do what you want, right? Um, and this stuff is is pretty buggy. Uh, it's gotten it's come a long way, but there's still a lot of challenge. Um, that's the cost of living on the cutting edge, right? Um, in this particular case, I'll tell you the one gotcha. Um, you know, to make so. Well, now actually, let me show back to my source. So the component itself, that uh, animate changes component, its template is also kind of simple. It's just, it's just the structure for having some divs to wrap, and it's got a next, and a next value and a current value. And that's, the tricky, that's one of the tricky things with Ember. If, you're not, uh, if you just kind of came off of a, here's an Ember 101 tutorial, 
you know, how would you actually show the old and the new values of something bound into your template at the same time, right? This is a, a very simple pattern for doing that. Um, you know, we're literally going to have a computed property that when you set it, uh, it's going to set the next value. It's going to trigger off the animation. And uh, when the animation's done, it's going to set the current value. And so just by within the component itself, the component can have memory, right? The component can remember what the previous value was. It can be rendering it as current and while it's rendering the next value as next. And then it, we can fi all we do in the component is, is toggle an animating class. And the animating class is what's going to tell the CSS animation rules to drop that, drop that div down vertically so that we get that nice little slide there. And um, so that's just a, that's a, you know, a CSS3 translation, a web, a, you know, WebKit transform, translate. And um, one of the kind of gotchas when you do the first time you try to do this animation is you'll set an overflow hidden so that the, the, letter, the, the numbers that are falling off the bottom disappear. And they won't disappear because welcome to the world of having accelerated contexts versus non-accelerated contexts in the browser. Right? The, the trick is, um, you know, browsers can do these really clever animations now, and even on mobile where they don't have as much horsepower, um, because they're pushing off a lot of work onto the, the essentially onto the GPU, right? Onto accelerated graphics, and that has weird interactions when parts of your page are accelerated and parts aren't. So, kind of their first go-to hack is to actually transform everything, even if it's not moving. Set it to just a transform of zero. That forces it onto an accelerated context. And then it will, those, those elements will interact together properly. So in, for, in order for me to, to hide those hidden numbers, the, the div that's hiding them has to also be translated, even though it's not going anywhere. Um, so let's see. And the, uh, I covered all that source. So now thinking about this pattern with next and current, um, this is the simplest possible case with, with, where we've just got a single value we're tracking. But if you think about using this, you know, there's no reason that my value can't actually be a whole model, right? There's no reason my component can't have a memory for what the previous model was and the current model and be able to show both simultaneously so that I can animate between them. So it's a powerful pattern. Um, and as I was saying, this, this easy class of, of animation is very componentizable. So there's no reason we can't, as a community, develop you know, a good tool shelf of these kind of things. Um, so another kind of reusable, very basic component that by itself isn't that impressive, but that enables us to do more interesting things is um, I've got a, an element here. I'm going to, oh, I don't have the source for this one shown. There's literally a component called uh, measured box. And I have it, I have it uh, measuring this red box here that's only two pixels tall right now. And so if I put some title here and I add some text, right, you can see that my measured box is actually using bindings to tell me exactly how tall my element is, the distance between those two red lines. Right. So super simple. Um, but once you've, this is a very easily packaged up component that you could drop in your template anywhere. And it's going to create a bound property that you can use to observe the size of something. Right. That's important because a lot of the, the things that CSS animations offer us don't really, they don't deal with height auto. You know, if you want to animate a lot of a lot of properties, if you want something to go from visible to shrunken and you want to animate its height, you can't just say go from auto to zero. You have to give it a height and go to zero. It's one of the most annoying things about CSS animations. So this lets us actually take advantage of what Ember's great at, which is tracking state and binding it um, to do that for us. So we can actually bind that and always have this bound value to know what the current height of that content is. So then that lets us go on to build um, other kinds of properties where you know maybe we've got a form and we want it to grow nicely when we change things, right? And um, and we want to do that all in it without messing up, without making our, our uh, template complicated. So we literally just have a tag called growing box that wraps that, right? And so just by dropping in growing box here and putting everything else inside of it, um, I get this behavior where no matter what I change inside that box, it's going to smoothly animate up and down, right? Um, So here's another example built on those same primitives. Uh, you know, maybe we want to have a form that adapts, right? And so in an animation like this, uh, I'm using an animated if helper. Oops. Right, so I literally have a helper that looks like this, right? 
if requires license, show me this stuff. Otherwise, show me this stuff. All right? And so then in my controller, I could just have a computed property that says, well, if, if they're renting a car, they need a license. If a bike, they don't. And so I can express very, uh, you know, my controller only needs to know about domain things, right? It only needs to know that, you know, a, a car requires a license and a bicycle doesn't. It has that computed property. And then directly into, in, my, in my view layer, in that template, I can actually just express how to represent each of those situations. Uh, and, and a couple of the nice things about this, you know, um, they're still stateful, right? So if you started entering a driver's license number and then you, act, you said, oh, actually, I want a bike, or actually, I want a car, right? The data's still there, right? Um, really powerful stuff that you just get for free because Ember is, you know, doing all, doing all the right things with the data binding. So there's a lot of opportunity to do clever, clever things uh, without a lot of extra stuff. In, in this case, I'm talking about. So all this I've been talking about so far is the kind of uh, simpler case of animations within a single route. Uh, so moving on to animations between routes is where it gets more complex today. You know, today, uh, today it's now possible. It was it used to be kind of intractable or super hacky, and now that we have a fully asynchronous router with some good hooks you can do uh, pretty nice transitions from route to route. But you're not going to find a drop-in library that solves this problem for you. you know, it really touches every aspect of the stack. You need to, you cooperation between your views and your controllers and your routes. Uh, so I think that this is an area where you know, Ember overall, as we evolve to what will be the Ember 2.0 API, stable API, I think this is an area where this support for this kind of stuff uh, you know, making a transition a first class object with, the, with these, that supports these kind of behaviors, there's a place for that in core, and it's not there today. But I could show you what we, have with, what we can do with the hooks we have, and there's actually quite a lot. Um, so this is back to my example of sliding over. And um, you can see the URL, right? So, so this is actually a parent to child transition, right? So when I go into a detailed record, I'm getting a new URL for that person. And, um, Parent to ch nested routes are actually really great, really supportive of animations like this because the parent route stays rendered, right? So when I come in and render this parent route, uh, what I'm really rendering is a, is a view that's twice as wide as what you see. And on the right-hand side, it has its outlet tag. And right now, there's nothing in the outlet tag because I'm, I'm just at the parent route's index route, right? Um, when I want to jump to the detail view, I'm necessarily rendering that outlet just like I would. That's stock Ember. That's nothing specific to the animations. The only extra trick is that my, con my parent controller has a computed property that's watching to see am I in a detailed route or not just by, you know, just by binding itself to the application route, which always has a property to show you what route you're in. And, um, and it flips, a f flips one class, right? And just flipping one class is enough to use the CSS rules to trigger that transition. So, that's, the, that's enough of the story to explain how I get into this child route. Uh, it all just works. It's really nice. And it's because this kind of hierarchical pattern is very common, you can actually find that it covers a lot of the cases you would use in a practical application. The trick is how you get back out, right? Because if you did the natural thing in Ember and you just transition to your parent route again, the child route de-renders immediately, right? It's gone. And so it would disappear before it had time to slide away. So that's a, this is where we need to take advantage of a hook that you might not otherwise be using, which is the will, trans, will transition action handler on, a, on your route. Um, so if we look at, this is the route for uh, the detail view, the child view. Right? It has a simple model that's finding my sample person. It has a back action that transitions back to the parent. And it has this will transition handler. And so this is, one, this is a place where there's like, you know, if there's probably one gnarly snippet of code in my presentation you might want to you know, snag and use, take a look at this stuff because uh, there's a lot of cases to think about. You know, we basically want to, to stall that transition from happening long enough to animate away. But we only want to do it in certain cases. Right? So for example, if, if we're transitioning within our, within our child route to it, one of its children, we won't necessarily, that's, that doesn't invoke our animate back action. If we're and if we're, similarly, if we're transitioning from our child route to something far away, so actually, if I, I can do that, right? 
if I'm looking at one of these detailed people, and I want to jump to a wholly different slide, which is a different route entirely, I don't want to wait for that slide back and then jump, right? There's no point to it, which is why um, we, we detect that case. We can actually see uh, if the destination is beyond our parent, we don't need to wait. We can just say go, right? But if we're actually doing a transition directly from the child to the parent, uh, then we actually tell the transition to abort. And that's going to completely stop the router. It's going to wait. It's going to do nothing. And we're going to actually, um, you know, we're, gonna, we're manually telling our controller to start to slide back. And uh, we're waiting for it to finish. And then we're restarting the transition. So, you know, this is a little bit of, I'm not going to call it internals because I think this is, I mean, will transition is clearly a public API, right? But all of these steps, I think, are another area where uh, as, we, as we as a community evolve our APIs, I think this is, this is the kind of stuff that I would like to see get better. Uh, and I'd love to hear your ideas on, on ways to make it better. Um, so, uh, but it has, it has, you know, it has a whole bunch of nice features though once we've got this, right? It's still true Ember in the sense that, you know, I can go to a detailed view and if instead of hitting my back button, I could actually just use the back button and it will work, right? Because everything's got a URL. That's, it's powerful. Um, and so uh, similar to that, I'll go to my, this is my, actually my last piece of the demo. My launch button shows us a modal, right? And, um, and it's a modal that behaves the way a modal should in an Ember app. It has a real state in the URL. I can dismiss it with a back button. And it's truly modal in the sense that it's not actually tied to this route. Um, if you look at my, at my URL here, I'm using query params. Query params new, you know, bleeding edge feature, caution. Uh, but modal, uh, modals are actually a really na natural match with query params. And I don't want to steal the thunder if anybody's going to talk about query params, Alex. I don't know. Yeah, so I won't go into too much detail. But the, the thing about them is that they kind of bypass routing and go directly to your controllers. And so you could just have a controller that's watching, is my modal pop, should I be showing my modal pop-up? And if so, I'm going to render it into a named outlet that's high enough up in my DOM tree that it's going to go in the right place. So there's kind of two key Ember features there that you might not think of as related to animating a modal. It's named outlets and query frames, but together they make it really nice. And so because it's truly modal, you know, I could actually go directly into this modal state from any slide. Right? I could be over here, and just by putting in the URL, my modal comes back. Right? So, and, and I did that all without kind of polluting all of my views by putting modal-specific stuff into all of them. All I really did in this case, and you could take a look at the source yourself for sure, went, or peruse it in detail. Um, you know, again, I just had I have an extra named outlet in my application template. It's just an outlet named modal. And I'm using a query param that when it's true, I'm rendering stuff into there. And, and what I'm rendering has its own CSS rules that make it come flying up beautifully, right? And make a shadow behind it. And just like in the previous case, the only gotcha, again, is dismissing it. Because again, if we just dismissed it by transitioning away, it would just disappear before it had a chance to animate away. And so to make it go away pretty, we use that same exact will transition hook. Right? So it needs to intercept the fact that we're leaving stop the transition, trigger the animation, wait for the animation to finish, and then start the transition back up. And so, um, so that's, pretty much, that's all the demos I have to show. Um, as I said, this is an Ember app, and you should check it out and play with it. The source is on GitHub. Um, yeah, like I said, that's not the kind of animation you really want to put in your, uh, in your app. Um, so I guess we have some time for questions. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so with respect to uh, animating uh, bindings, I'm curious if you uh, run into next one. Uh, with respect to animating bindings, I'm curious if you run into the case where uh, with view reuse, so let's say the content is changing for review or using Ember yes. list view or something, and do you have a strategy for how to approach that? Yeah, nicely? so that's, that's um, that could be a tricky issue if you're not careful. So you know, it, the question is really, um, it boils down to the fact that Ember does something which is a good thing, which is uh, if, you've, if you're transitioning from, say, actually, let's go to a specific example. Um, 
let's say I'm looking at person number seven here, right? And I, wanna, and I just want to transition directly to person number eight instead, whether I did it via URL or I did it you know, by a link. Um, that view, the original view object and everything that was already in place gets to stay in place. It doesn't need a new view, right? All, we've already got bindings set up, so all we have to do is swap the model out from the, the controller stays the same. We just put a new model in the controller. The bindings do the work, and the page renders, and it's great. Um, where that gets you is if you're going to have special animation behaviors that only happen when the view itself renders, they're not going to run in that case. Right? Um, and so the, the, the kind of catch is the individual data bindings, like the, indiv the birthday and the name on this page, uh, they are completely agnostic to whether they're changing because their own value just changed or their whole model just changed. Right? And um, trying to make them detect the difference is kind of the path to madness. And you could, you could spend a lot of time messing with those bugs, and I've done it. And it's, it's better to find ways not to have to answer that question. And so, um, you know, so one idea is actually what I alluded to, and I don't have this fully sketched out in a demo, but instead of, instead of trying to track the individual uh, properties, to actually track the models themselves. So to have a, com to have a component or a controller that um, holds onto the previous model using computed properties, right? It does its thing as that model changes. Uh, so that you could track it at the per model level and not at the individual property level, where it's too late to know whether, you know, whether my whole model just shifted out from under me or a single property changed. And that's actually really important. You know, it has come up multiple times practically in my application, where even if you just imagine an app where you want like a field to flash if some other user changes it while you're looking at it, right? Um, the naive way to implement that, it's also going to flash every time you switch records. And that's not, what, that's not really your goal. So yes. Um, and so I, I do think the solution to that kind of problem is to try to move up one level and to try to keep track of the models changing themselves. And um, you know, sometimes all you can do is actually, uh, you, know, you could, e there's some hacks you can play. You know, you could even um, basically force a redraw that's going to force the view to redraw if, in the cases where you want a truly new model. You know, one of the, one of the kind of nice things about CSS transition and animation properties is you can set them up so that there are things that happen when that DOM's created and not again, right? So that's a great time to do the kind of things you want to only happen when a model's changing. Um, Ember's gonna not recreate that DOM for you, but you can force it to, right? Uh, just strategically putting if blocks in the right places are gonna, con gonna kind of cause cascading re-renders. So you can play tricks, and uh, it's, it's, again, not, you know, not as fully baked as, as I think we're going to evolve it to be, but it's a good start. Yeah. Um, another thing I didn't actually uh, go into any detail on, but I'd be happy to talk to anybody about, is um, mobile-specific concerns. Um, I'll, you know, everything I've been showing applies great on mobile. You know, I, my app is, is an Ember app packaged up into, into PhoneGap that runs on iPads, and it um, it's feels native, it's very smooth and nice, and I've had to learn a bunch of tricks to keep it that way. Um, one thing, actually, uh, that you might not realize is that Ember's installing, well, you, you might if you've ever thought about it, but Ember's installing event handlers at the top of the DOM tree. And um, some of them you might not even be using, but they're there, and they actually have a cost, um, even in a, in a totally unintuitive way, um, because you might not actually do anything with, say, a, a scroll event. You know, there's, there's literally a function that runs nothing when the scroll event fires. But just the very existence of that handler prevents the, the hardware from optimizing you out of the equation entirely. So that scrolling, touch scrolling, might actually feel kind of janky. Right? Jank is the word for when it's just not, you know, it's just almost subconsciously wrong. You know, and if you stop and think about it, it's like, yeah, it's because it's, there's a subtle lag or a, you know, a stutter, subtle stuttering in my scroll. And you've, you've encountered it all the time. And, sometimes, and it doesn't even always rise to the level of this feels slow. It's more like this feels crappy. I don't get it, what, what the problem is. And um, simply by making sure that there's absolutely no ir un irrelevant event handlers in the loop at all lets the hardware take over and go directly from the, the event of the user's finger to the hardware-accelerated motion of the, of the screen. And it, it's a 
it's a substantially different feeling. Once you appreciate the difference, you'll, you can't unsee, and you'll look for it. Um, so I actually, in my mobile app, disable some of Ember's own event handlers and only turn them on for the subsections of the DOM where I need them. And, so, and you could do that by basically packaging them up as components, right? So I have, a little, I have a component that I wrap around pieces of the DOM where I actually do care about scroll events, or I do care about touch start events. And um, you know, this is where you could spend kind of you know, unbounded amounts of time and effort trying to micro-optimize, and you've got to pick your battles, because it does add to the complexity of app. Um, but I guess my, if there was a bottom line, I would say that um, you know, using Ember doesn't, certainly doesn't preclude, and I think overall helps you in building these kind of rich behaviors, and in, in helping you know, the web platform kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with would you build a native app on mobile, right? So, uh, yeah, I think I'm out of time. I'm only hovering because it's ice cream and it will melt. Sorry? <laughs> said I'm hovering because it's ice cream. All right, uh, ice cream time. Thank you so much. A round no of applause for Edward.